So I think we can we can go ahead. Let's start. Right about now, the funk soul brother. Check it out now, the funk soul brother. Right about now, the funk soul brother. Check it out now, the funk soul brother. Right about now, the funk soul brother. Check it out now. Absolutely. So uh, this is history today uh, for a very simple reason. It's the first ever Inside Entrepreneurship uh, Radio uh, by Alumni Show. It is organized by the INSEAD MAG Entrepreneurship Center and uh, obviously Sabrine Monsegur is here. So uh, Sabrine, it's very cool that you are here with us to host this show and uh, it's organized by uh, myself, Gilles Le Guenec, and that's not the point here. The most important thing is our guest. Our guest today is Yann Lechelle. Yann Lechelle is a professional entrepreneur and during the next 60 minutes, is going to talk with us and to the audience about entrepreneurship because that's the main purpose of this 60 minute show. Uh, discover what entrepreneurship is all about, address very narrow and interesting topics and get key learnings for all the audience. So, uh, Jan, thank you very much for being here and hello. Hey, thanks for having me, it's great. It's <laughs> good to be the first to inaugurate this uh, format. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really cool. So, uh, Yann Lechel, uh, I think that you know quite a lot of people from the INSEAD because you're an entrepreneur in residence. You've been an entrepreneur in residence for years now. And uh, you had a very, and you have a very successful career as a professional entrepreneur, as you define yourself. Uh, you created many, many companies, actually. Very interesting startups, very successful, several exits. And uh, you are a business guy and also a tech guy. Actually, you're one of the few I know who have this kind of skills. So uh, today for the first show, the purpose is to talk about convergence and to talk about how you manage to get your startup IDs because you had plenty of them and it seems that you built a kind of way to do it. And so you're going to talk about all this. All the people of the audience, if you want to ask question, I ask you to use the chat, which is available. Then uh, we're going to read all these questions and uh, we're going to ask the question ourselves. Sabrine, is there something that you want to tell us from the INSEAD MAG Entrepreneurship Center? No, actually, I would like to, I would like to thank uh, very much Jan also, and I would like to thank you very much to Gilles because um, it's, uh, it's one of your crazy and great ideas, you know, to make entrepreneurship uh, fun, and I'm very proud to belong to this project too. Uh, welcome to everybody, you know, I see the number of attendees, you know, growing, growing, and growing, so thank you all very much for yeah, hello, hello Michael, so thank you, thank you all, and uh, as you can see the chat works well, so uh, you're more than welcome, as uh, as you said, if you have questions, please use the chat on the Twitter account, and um, we will try to manage your questions, and, uh, and Jan will be very pleased to answer it. Thank you very much all, let's start it. Great. Okay. Shall we go? Yeah, please. Okay, so thanks everyone for showing up uh, and hearing this uh, podcast. It's a, it's a first, it's a pleasure. Um, as you said, clearly my, my profile is one that I qualify as a professional entrepreneur. Um, by that I mean that I, I have sort of, you know, systematized and then made uh, not, not a career because my career is not over, but so essentially a sequence and a number of entrepreneurial activities um, that define my lifestyle. In other words, um, a serial entrepreneur is typically someone who's done it multiple times. And in my case, I see entrepreneurship as, a, as an enabler uh, for my ecosystem. Um, in Paris, for instance, the, the ecosystem has been growing um, quite systematically for the past 15 years. It's been shaky at first, um, and typically I find that all the companies that I've created in Paris are part of the greater ecosystem. And so as a professional entrepreneur, I'm happy to play a role within the ecosystem, not just as part of the founder, co-founder, or employee of a startup. So I'd like to cover these aspects. 
on top of what keeps me busy uh, these days, which is the company that I'm currently involved with, um, which is SNPs, which is an AI uh, artificial intelligence company focused on the assistant. So perhaps a bit of a background. Uh, as some of you perhaps know, I graduated from INSEAD in July 2001. That was 15, 17 years ago. Um, and there is a career before INSEAD and a career after INSEAD for me. I started coding when I was 10 years old. So software is very much part of my DNA in the sense that as an entrepreneur, I think software and I think software products. And that defines me as an entrepreneur. I'm not a financial entrepreneur. I'm not a marketing driven entrepreneur. I'm a product entrepreneur. This is what drives me. Uh, and you can see in my past that I was involved as a software engineer in a number of projects, uh, typically working in a financial software industry or in the cartoon animation industry. I worked at DreamWorks for a few years, uh, working on the back office side of things. Uh, in the financial software industry, I worked on uh, real-time trading platforms uh, in Paris, but also in New York. And um, INSEAD came as a way for me to transcend my product-only view of the world and gave me the business acumen that I needed to become a self uh, or autonomous entrepreneur, if you wish. So I, I clearly see my, my career as a, as a dual uh, try, the first one, which is one of, a, of an engineer, applied engineer, and the second one of a business person and creating a fusion between the two essentially allows me to, you know, inject the creativity that you can, you can leverage from software into business opportunities. Uh, and this is what I've done since INSEAD. So if, if I look back since INSEAD, I've started four companies. Um, and slightly before INSEAD, I was part of a startup that we exited also just in time, uh, just before the internet crashed actually, so good timing. And um, these startups have one thing in common, which is software. Uh, but I see myself as a generalist. In other words, um, I can apply my, my software skills and my view of the world to a number of areas, including social networks, mobile apps, advertising, um, and more recently, artificial intelligence. Um, so if I, if I look sequentially, and actually it's not so sequential, that's why I'm not necessarily just a serial entrepreneur, but also a, a parallel entrepreneur. Um, the first company I created was in 2001, just after INSEAD. And uh, this was a time uh, that followed the internet crash. So essentially, I think, I, if I recall properly, I was probably the only entrepreneur out of INSEAD in July 2001. Of course, many more entrepreneurs came from my promotion in the years after, but 2001 was really a bad time to start a, a tech company. In any case, I, I started in Paris, a social network applied to um, closed networks. And INSEAD became a client, as well as uh, you know, HSC, Manchester Business School. And my thoughts go with uh, uh, the city of Manchester, uh, with what happened yesterday. Um, so these were clients in the past, but uh, uh, the events uh, yesterday you know, prove that we are in a global world and uh, uh, you know, as entrepreneurs, as citizens, we play a part in the, in the whole uh, global ecosystem. So we're reminded of that, unfortunately, uh, all too frequently. And so um, Ethereal was a, a company providing a closed social network at a time where Facebook was not so popular yet uh, Facebook became popular between 2004 and 2007. And so creating a social network um, with a SaaS delivery model was quite challenging because the market was not quite ready. The IT departments didn't like the idea of, of you know, knowledge or information or user accounts being hosted on external websites. And uh, so that proved to be difficult to, uh, to educate the market and to gain traction. Nevertheless, the company grew uh, to a point where it was profitable and I sold it in 2007. Uh, after which the iPhone came out and uh, this was a platform that was familiar with 
from the early 90s because the iPhone was built on top of, a, of an ecosystem that was founded by Steve Jobs in the early 90s and acquired again by Steve Jobs uh, when he joined Apple uh, again in the late 90s. So that ecosystem, software development ecosystem, I was familiar with and was the foundation for my next, next company, which was called Kick Your App, co-founded with a friend of mine. And the idea was to build applications for marketing purposes. So this was an unscalable business in many ways, consulting operation. And uh, the timing was right because the app ecosystem was literally booming. So two different companies, one of which was a scalable model without fundraising. I was the sole founder. The second one was uh, not capital intensive because it only required uh, you know, one client to pay for the, for the workforce, uh, but less scalable, of course. But this was essentially you know, camped by the local market that we had. And I much preferred focusing on the product. So I built a company called AppSpider with yet another co-founder, this time raising funding. So we raised 700,000 euros at the time from a prototype. And this was in France in 2010, at a time where essentially we didn't have yet super angels. In other words, angel investors who had been very successful in the web economy. Um, and so these super angels came literally out of the closet in 2010 and invested in the app economy through us. So we raised a pretty, a pretty significant sum of money, free product, free revenue, uh, with people who had made a fortune in, in the web 1.0 era. So these guys were called uh, Marc Simoncini, um, Xavier Niel, Jacques-Antoine Grandjean, and they've been a driving force in the French ecosystem. It's important to, to note how the generations follow each other and empower the next generations. Very often we see people trying to compare the, the Parisian or the Berlin um, or the London ecosystem comparing it to Silicon Valley and I think that's misleading. What you need to compare is the number of generations within an ecosystem because the, the ecosystem is being professionalized uh, and this is typically the sort of skills that I want to bring to the marketplace. Uh, having gone through a number of companies, a number of M&As and um, essentially guiding the new generations to a faster execution cycle. Silicon Valley has had over 50 years um, to build up their ecosystem. So the French ecosystem, or let's say Paris, has its own dynamics, it has its own place. And therefore, I think we all need to be patient a little bit uh, because you don't replicate Silicon Valley overnight. Um, so, you know, going through the, the various entities that I've built and scaled, um, uh, the one that I founded, co-founded in 2010 was called AppSpire, was an app recommendation engine, um, similar to what Google does for websites. AppSpire was uh, trying to do this for the app stores. We grew the application base to 12 million users. And um, this was a global application, by the way, with 13 languages covered. And at some point, Apple, uh, because of various um, players who had essentially uh, become market makers and therefore influenced the rankings, Apple decided to, to refuse any application that was recommending apps as a business. Um, so we had to pivot. And as a result, we had to also exit and sell the company. Um, the first company that I sold in 2007, I bought back in 2012, um, essentially cleaned it up, uh, you know, pivoted to a different uh, business model and also sold it uh, six months ago. So, you know, three, four companies that, that went full cycle between uh, founding, scaling, um, exiting to some degree with some very success. Um, to the point where in early 2015, I was looking for my next move. And by that I meant I was looking for the next 10 years. What is going to be significant in the next 10 years in software, because this is what I like to do. And this is where I have most intuition. And it turns out that uh, in the early 90s, I was building neural networks for my uh, last year 
thesis at the university. And uh, neural networks at the time were not very powerful. AI was very promising. And essentially, I did nothing with it because it was not you know, part of uh, the project they're working on. Um, and yet, research in AI kept uh, going on. Computing power kept increasing, and data collection, which is key in AI, uh, progressed to the point where people now call it big data. So I'm not necessarily impressed by big data, but big data means that it's almost systematic. We collect a lot of data, and now we're able to process it. And AI thrives on big data. Why? Because you can build models out of it. So AI is a bit frightening, but it's not. It's really just a set of algorithms. It's a toolbox. Uh, that you can use to build on top of data and create value out of it. So early 2015, I was looking for the next 10 years, you know, the next decade. And today, actually, if we look back the past 10 years, the past 10 years were all about the app economy, how the smartphones took over the world. And the next 10 years are going to be quite different. So early 2015, I met uh, someone called Rand Hindi, the founder of SNPs, which was a small operation working with uh, bigger groups, working on big data models. And um, Rand wanted to pivot and create AI for the consumer. What we wanted to do at the time is essentially uh, transfer a lot of the back office intelligence that you create on top of big data and transfer it to the consumers. And this is, this is how I joined SNPs, in fact. So this was the first company in the past 15 years that I joined as an employee um, because the company had been created before. Rand had two co-founders, um, Mael Primé and um, Mikael Fester. And, and the three of them had tremendous talent in applied AI. I'd already assembled a small team, and that's when I decided to join them as COO. Um, and precisely, they were looking for someone who had gone full cycle to raise funding, to grow the company in terms of HR, in terms of processes, and in terms of sales. Um, so I'm quite happy to talk about that now, if uh, everyone is interested. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about SNPs. Um, SNPs is a company that is based in Paris. We are 41, 42 people right now, actually. And um, most of the team is essentially engineering and machine learning data science uh, expertise. We're only just starting to monetize and commercialize our product. SNPs has one goal, and that's the main vision, which is to make technology disappear. We think AI is a terrific technology to actually shave off the friction that we have on a day-to-day -day with technology. And technology is only just you know, passing along, it's progressing. If you think way back, uh, electricity was dangerous and, and hard to, uh, to, to handle, uh, and today we don't even think about it. Electricity is, a, is an afterthought. It's in the buildings, it's wired in, it's in our pocket within the smartphone. Some people wear pacemakers inside their own bodies. They don't even think about it. Um, so technology tends to blend in, tends to, to become so optimal that we don't even think about it. So for us, AI is a strong ally. Why? Because precisely, it will grow to a point where the machines adopt, adapt to us, not the reverse. In fact, when we look back in time, the first computer was a mainframe. And the mainframe came when you bought a mainframe. It came with people. People were attached to it because it was so complicated to operate. You needed a PhD to operate a computer. Um, and then later on, computers became a little more intuitive. Um, you could uh, start interacting with keyboards, uh, but the mainframe was still you know, in, in, this, in the data center, essentially. So the mainframe was the brain, and the terminal was just a terminal, a dumb terminal, as, as you call them. And as the years passed, the technology transferred some of its power to the terminal. In other words, it goes from mainframe to the client, and that's when the personal computing era uh, began with MS-DOS, some of you may remember. Um, and the interfaces kept 
progressing to the point where the need for a degree or the need for uh, you know the geek factor decreased to the point where people could start handling a computer with relative ease and this is when the Macintosh came out with a graphical user interface this came out of the labs at first of course the Xerox uh, Palo Alto Research Center the park these guys actually invented the graphical user interface. Steve Jobs turned it into a consumer device. And Microsoft essentially, you know, copied the trend and transformed MS-DOS into Microsoft Windows, thereby allowing everyone to start using a computer with relative ease. And then the next wave, of course, is to shrink out of that and, you know, pack all the computing power into a handheld computer. And this is the personal assistant era. It started with the, um, uh, it's a UK company called Scion, um, and they had the first digital assistant. Nokia came up with a communicator in the late 90s. Some of you may remember the Palm Pilot, which was not necessarily connected at first. Um, the Blackberry at the time called RIM was a pager with keyboard and built-in communication. All these devices essentially converged, uh, and it took quite a bit of time. It took a decade for these personal assistants to fuse into the iPhone. The iPhone was all about convergence. In fact, if you go back to the keynote that Steve Jobs gave in 2007, before showing the iPhone, he was repeating three times, it's a phone, it's a web browser, it's an iPod. So at the time, the iPod was really uh, one vector of convergence that mattered to Apple. But essentially, by repeating three times, he outlined the fact that the iPhone was a result of converging capabilities and features. And that created a new category, essentially. And Apple was not the first. Microsoft had, with Compaq and HP, um, created handheld devices that had communication capabilities. But the convergence truly expressed itself with the iPhone because the computing power was sufficient, the screen was you know, haptic, tactile, um, and, um, and the operators also were capable of providing sufficient bandwidth. So convergence is a key component to define a new category. And if we look at the accessibility in the computing era, then it goes from a very artificial interface all the way to a natural interface. And this trend is really something that we can you know, lay on the last 70 years. The first type of computers required actual wires and then punch cards. And then you had to use a command line in the MS-DOS world. Um, and then the graphical user interface, the touch, the haptic user interface. You know, this is, this is where the era we're in. And the new decade is all about even more natural interfaces. And this is what we see, and this, this is precisely what we're working on at SNPs. The next decade is all about the voice interfaces. And voice is a lot more natural than graphical user interfaces when you think about it. Actually, I like the anecdote of, you know, parents sometimes are amazed at their child, children, and that's quite natural, but it's a little biased if you feel quite honest with, uh, with yourself. So a parent seeing a toddler you know, handling an iPad sometimes says, oh, my kid is a genius, he uses the iPad better, better than I do. And often I say, no, the genius is you, the parent, who's had to, to master the mouse and the, you know, hand-eye coordination. So, frankly, technology is getting easier and easier to access, to use. And technology companies are making sure that their technologies are being used or can be accessed by 100% of humanity. So if you take a computer from the 80s, a personal computer, that was not accessible by all. It was hard to master. If you take a smartphone, now we're talking a big chunk of the human population. We are two, almost three billion uh, users of smartphones. The voice interface, now that becomes interesting because voice requires little to no interaction. All you have to do is use a tool that you use on a daily basis, 
to express yourself. And of course, there are more ways of natural interfaces that will come down the line, which is augmented reality and augmented humanity. But what I find fascinating is the fact that as we talk about artificial intelligence, essentially, it's the contrary that happens to the accessibility. We go from zero artificial intelligence with 100% artificial interfaces to 100% natural interfaces with probably a lot of artificial intelligence. And this is what we need, essentially, for machines to adapt to human beings and not the contrary. So let's look at the context today in 2017 because you know, AI is very much part of the you know, fantasy as well. Uh, and Hollywood plays a big part in that. If we look at Moore's law, Moore's law is essentially an exponential curve that maps the number of transistors available in, in chips. It's exponential. It doesn't matter if it's going to plateau at some point because Moore's law is being compounded by big data and AI algorithms. So technology is actually sitting on an exponential curve. And meanwhile, uh, human beings are on a flat curve, Darwin's curve. So this curve is essentially flat and competes with an exponential. I'm a technologist and I feel technology in my guts and I find it to be growing a little too fast, even though I consider myself almost a digital native um, because I've grown with technology from the youngest age. So essentially what I'm saying is that it's growing very, very fast and we need to keep a tab on, on what's happening with this technology and how we build solutions with that. Connected devices will grow exponentially as well. Essentially, the, anal the analysts, they tell us that we will have about 100 billion devices, connected devices, by 2030. By then, we'll be about 10 billion people on Earth. So that's 10 connected devices per individual. That's quite stressful as a future if you consider that devices have the ability to notify you every time they feel like it. So you know, at home, actually, I'm, you know, I have a regular home with a regular number of uh, smartphones and tablets and connected speakers, and I do have 25 devices at home uh, on my router. So I'm already way above that average. And all of these devices require my attention to be configured, to be upgraded, and it's a pain. So clearly, AI will play a part in that. Now, there's an issue I find with data, personal data and AI, which is that it is essentially trusted by big corporations, the states, and the states are trying to maximize you know, general. Um, but the little guys, the individuals, they don't have access to big data and AI. So that's a problem. The market is essentially skewed towards corporations and states. And, um, and the question is, you know, what can we do to make sure that technology serves the interests of individuals and not just business? Because this will backfire if it's not handled properly. So Mark Andreessen likes to say that software is eating the world. Um, the CEO of NVIDIA is saying that AI is going to eat software. So it's, it's, it's that big. And the CEO of NVIDIA is onto something because he's essentially beating Intel at the chip uh, manufacturing game. Why? Because the, the NVIDIA chips are precisely, precisely targeting compute intensive operations that are similar between games. So NVIDIA video graphics cards usually serve high-end games for 3D rendering, but they also serve and deep learning, which is one of the techniques uh, used in AI. So AI is, a, as I said, a, a toolbox that contains a, a family, a subset called machine learning. And within that toolbox, there is deep learning. And everyone remind, remembers uh, the game of Go and how DeepMind, a company that has been since acquired by Google, um, beat the, the champion in Go. The analyst. The, the people who knew better, supposedly, thought that no machine could beat the grand master at gold for the next 10 years. 
not before the next decade. And this is to show you how dramatic the exponential is compared to what human beings have the ability to predict. This exponential curve is powerful and will create convergence that, that will be hard to map. So that's why it's important as we build new businesses, as we you know, cater innovation towards new businesses, we try to identify the weak signals that will converge at a rapid pace, a pace that is hard to predict. Again, who could predict that the iPhone would become a category in and out of itself, later joined with uh, Google Android? But essentially, you do have two players that took away all the possibilities from Microsoft, from IBM and all that, in a, in a market that transformed literally in a couple of years. So the question is, how do we identify convergence over the next 10 years? So a neural network is a technique, and there's you know, a lot of analysis is done because of deep learning, because of the way it actually uh, uses big data to train models. So we're not going to just you know, focus on that because AI is a big family of algorithms and it's good to actually leverage the entire toolbox. Um, but I'd like to, to also point out that the way the, you know, the general awareness is constructed also in, you know, is hindered or influenced by Hollywood. And a lot of people see AI as essentially um, either, you know, how the, the computer in um, Space Odyssey or Skynet in Terminator. I much prefer, prefer the poetic rendering that you find in the movie from uh, uh, Spike Jones, uh, the film called Her, and it's a much more poetic and in a way realistic um, rendering of what AI could produce at scale. But let's go back to the toolbox. AI is really something that I invite everyone listening to this podcast in the business world to get acquainted with. AI is really a toolbox and it's, it's full of direct and indirect applications in the back office and for the consumer. Uh, you, can, you can use it to, to do deep learning, which is you know, very well uh, suited for doing you know, facial recognition, sound recognition, um, any sort of um, it, it actually maps the way the brain functions to to understand and extract features from from noise. Then you can use um, AI techniques for evidence-based classification or machine learning systems, predictive analysis or predictive analytics, um, natural language understanding or natural language generation for chatbots. Recommendation engines. So there are many ways to apply AI, and certainly we're we're using it. And in our case, we're seeing that the next decade will all will be about voice. The convergence is voice. At the CES in Las Vegas, every single company was talking about integration with Alexa. Alexa is this cone. It's a speaker and a microphone that Amazon has built, and essentially they're seeding the market with this new interface. It's, uh, it's a green field. There is no such device in the kitchen today. Uh, so Amazon built that, and they built a business that surprised pretty much everyone, even Google. And they sold 35 million devices. In Silicon Valley, pretty much everyone has one. They've made it easy for um, developers to integrate with Alexa. So Alexa, for those of you who are not too familiar with it, is a, is a device that is essentially distributed in the U.S. and now in the U.K. Um, will, will let you talk to it from a distance in your kitchen in a way that is very similar to Siri. So, of course, Google created a competitor not, uh, not long ago called uh, Google Home, and we can all bet that Apple will come up with its own alternative uh, within the next few weeks, if not months. So essentially, Amazon creating a, new, creating a new category, it's hard to see what the impact will be from, 
places where it has not yet penetrated the market. So in France, for instance, a lot of people don't see that, but it's coming very, very strong um, in a way that is perhaps insignificant at first. But again, my view of the world and my view of Silicon Valley is slightly cynical. In other words, I don't think that Silicon Valley entrepreneurs are the greatest in the world, but they are, you know, creating technology in an ecosystem that will generate new use cases. Um, Jan? Yes? We have, uh, we have an interesting question from Michael Malek, who is an MBA uh, from um, 2006. Six yeah. uh, D actually, um, he's saying that it's interesting um, to learn your view and position on artificial intelligence within healthcare, and how it will affect the hard care tech evolution, and if you agree that it's going to be the next big disruption, and uh, quite rapid one indeed. Sure, and and clearly this is uh, one of the key areas. So. In my case, I'm really focusing on consumer experiences around voice, but healthcare will, of course, be dramatically be impacted by AI, because AI is, is pervasive. You can put AI in everything, and you should put AI in everything. In other words, to extract intuition from data, where human beings will either take too much time to process it, or simply cannot develop intuition. So, for instance, when when people do research, they do it in a way that is typically bootstrapped, right? They get research grants and they work on something for which they do have an intuition, but it's not systematic. If you throw millions and millions of records to an algorithm, that record will have a systematic approach to developing intuition. So what I'm saying is that today and perhaps in the past, it took 50 years for say, a molecule to be developed because research scientists um, have been tackling it in a way that was you know, fairly ad hoc. Now with AI, they should be able to speed up the process and focus on areas where AI has actually done the hard work, which is to prune out you know, all the directions that will not necessarily lead to the proper answer. So of course, you probably need collaboration between human beings and AI for a long time ahead, but there is no doubt that AI will radically impact healthcare. But I, I don't agree with the term, this is the next big thing. There are many next big things. So I'm focusing on, on voice for consumers, and to me that's the next consumer platform. But AI is one of the branches or industries that will be very positively impacted uh, by AI. And when I say positively, I say it will be positively impacted for those who manage to leverage AI. The others will, of course, be disrupted. And, uh, and, and Michael is also asking um, G, um, regarding you know, your view on AI and its natural evolution to voice and how it would help the rehabilitation industry. How far um, uh, are we uh, to uh, having AI at home to treat all most of basic medical needs? And uh, maybe we could ask Siri, like, or Alexa and talk to it about your symptoms and uh, it would recommend some treatment, for example, or do you think it's too far? Actually, I think there are multiple issues here. Um, one of the key issues that I find is linked to the fact that um, Siri, and Google Home and, uh, and Alexa are transaction platforms. They are built on top of platforms that I like to call, in France they're called the GAFAs, the Google and Apple and Facebook and Amazon. So in France we use an acronym called GAFA, but I call them the billion user club. And these are dominant players, they are platforms. Essentially what they're trying to do is compete with each other to trying to gain a monopoly, they won't be allowed to, but they are trying to get as close as possible to a monopolistic situation. By doing so, and to do so, they are cloud by design. And by being cloud by design, they trespass on fundamental, you know, 
rights that people should have when it comes to their personal data. So our approach is to say, well, voice, as much as a fingerprint, is a personal marker. It's a personal identifier, you know, ID. Uh, it's non-revocable. In other words, my voice should not be stored centrally on a server uh, and exploited as such. Similarly, my fingerprint should not leave the device in which it's being processed. Otherwise, if someone steals the central database, it will steal well, everyone's you know, unique identifiers. And that's a problem. So if you look at these platforms, they, they are too centrally powerful. And if you look at my, you know, the, my past demonstration on computing power going from you know, the mainframe in a large data center uh, going to the edge, to the terminal, well, it's happening today. In other words, the devices today are becoming the IoT, the Internet of Things, are becoming more and more powerful. So you can transfer a lot of the computing power from the mainframe, from the servers, to the edge, to the devices that do the processing. So our approach is to say, okay, we're going to build an assistant, which is, by the way, virtualized. We have a business that seeks to lock in the clients that need to build an assistant without depending on Apple and Google and uh, Amazon. In other words, we're providing an alternative that is working on device and that preserves you know, personal data. And we find that it is, it is essential to tackle issues in the personal health industry or healthcare industry at large and anything that touches fundamental rights in terms of personal data and clearly the European Commission is paying attention and they're rolling out the GDPR um, resolution in 2018 which will fine companies 4% of their global, global income if they don't comply with privacy rights. So this will be a major headache for medical companies and for platforms because they will have a very hard time complying with these regulations down the line, especially as consumers gain awareness about how their data is being used. So I, there is no doubt AI in the back office will help scale you know, businesses and leverage their data, but on the consumer end, you know, I don't think a Siri will have the ability to tap into your innermost, you know, intimacy. So, to build that, you need technology perhaps like ours for the assistance component, but also maybe a sort of a hybrid approach between people who have access to um, anonymized uh, medical data and, and perhaps uh, symptoms and uh, treatments. So I, I, I don't see a simple solution to, to the challenge uh, you know, mentioned by, uh, in the question, but essentially I see a hybrid approach between converging technology that addresses the personal data conundrum and the business intelligence behind treatment and symptoms. Okay, thank you very much, Jan. You're welcome. Okay. All right. I have I had a question, a philosophy question, I would say. Uh, uh, there is lots of unemployment right now already, and many people are wondering uh, about artificial intelligence. What will be the consequences about the employment? Uh, will it create an even bigger problem? Will it solve it? Uh, I would like to get your point of view about this, because it's a key social challenge coming, and. Uh, most of the time, the answers I get about the good things with artificial intelligence doesn't tackle at all this issue. So your point of view is more than welcome about this. Yeah. So um, again, I mean, if we if we uh, follow Hollywood, it's going to be uh, worse than that. In other words, not only is AI going to take our jobs, but they are going to annihilate the human race. I think it's not going to be that simple, not that uh, straightforward, but it will be painful. 
you know, technology has, has this particular uh, trait, which is it actually replaces human muscles. And muscles are, you know, in the arms and the legs, uh, but also the brain. The brain is a muscle. So the one thing that technology has done in the past has been to replace jobs with others. It has made labor less uh, difficult. In other words, you know, if you look at uh, transporting people in the past, you you had to um, to operate um, machines that were not efficient. You had to uh, pull people. You had to use animals. And we've removed, you know, the the organic factor from transportation. Um, so technology has removed jobs. Down the line, we think uh, Uber drivers. So Uber drivers did not exist 10 years ago. We have taxi drivers, but we've created a, a new category of jobs, Uber drivers. So we have many more drivers today than we had a few years back. Now, these people may need their jobs, but we have to look at the entire chain, right? So Uber drivers losing their jobs because Uber decides to uh, roll out uh, autonomous cars well let's look at it let's look at it in a grand scheme of things in other words people will have a more efficient commute and maybe they can get to work in a, in a way that is uh, you know, more productive in fact people who used to be drivers could be leveraging the driving the self-driving platform to get to new types of jobs so in other words you cannot look at a single event of one job being disrupted uh, by a given technology, but you have to look at it at the um, you know, holistic uh, and, uh, and global point of view. So my, my thinking is that this is inevitable and that the answer to, to that, of course, is education and continuing education. In other words, everyone who has a job that is threatened, potentially replaced by AI, should definitely think ahead and try and see how else they can repurpose their skills. So of course, it's, it's going to be more traumatic for people who have uh, low skills uh, that can be replaced by robots. But this is going to be the case forever going forward and has been the case for the past, uh, ever since technology started having an impact. So the question is not when, but how fast. And as we know, human beings, you know, live on the Darwinian uh, growing curve, so they don't evolve very rapidly. That's the one problem that I see, which is how fast. Okay, thank you. Uh, since you've been you've been working everywhere in the world, I think, because you've been working in America, been working in Europe. Uh, what do you think of France right now, especially since we have a new, uh, young, energetic president uh, willing to push the startup culture? What do you think is going to happen all this? What's your point of view about the current ecosystem? And is it better than Berlin, London, and better, as good as? What do you think? Well, I think the Parisian ecosystem is terrific right now. Um, I've been an entrepreneur in Paris for the past 16 years, 16, 17 years. Um, for me and my family, there's no better place to be. So of course we don't we don't have the same scale as in the U.S. And at the same time, we don't have the same um, level of competition. So uh, you can build a company here, perhaps with less capital, perhaps with less accessible markets. But then again, you know the world is global. Uh, you can tap a global market with technology with relative ease, and uh, you know. Roissy uh, Charles de Gaulle uh, Airport is, you know, is functional, uh, minus the strikes, but essentially you can, you can pan out from Paris if you build technology that is sufficiently scalable. So the Persian ecosystem is, is great, it's building up. Again, there's no need to compare with any other ecosystem. The point is, you know, you have, we have to make, make sure as you know, as a microeconomy or a niche economy within the greater economy, uh, that the system keeps growing up steadily um, without 
you know, going backwards uh, from time to time. We almost went back to zero in 2012 when uh, François Hollande got elected. The socialists wanted to align capital gain tax on income tax. Their, their view of the world was that anyone who was making money overnight had to be taxed heavily. Let's assume that this is irrational thinking. They forgot that angel investors and entrepreneurs were building value and perhaps as a result of a very harsh selection process, one time out of 10 would make 10 times their money, essentially break even. So the entrepreneurs, on average, they don't make a fortune. More often than not, they don't make a fortune. And at the same time, they create tremendous value because they hire people and they create new models and they, they help the, the economy uh, cycle through innovation and, uh, and other business models. So in 2012, we nearly killed the, the high-tech ecosystem in Paris or in France. Why? Because of a stupid taxation, dogmatic taxation law. We were lucky enough so that a few entrepreneurs became very vocal and um, someone called Jean Pellerin uh, in the government listened carefully and re retroactively modified the law so that if you were an entrepreneur or an angel investor, this taxation would not apply. And you know, this is one of the many events that could kill an ecosystem in the nest. So we've been lucky because the, the ecosystem has been building up, capital has been um, managed in a more and more professional way. So we can say that French VCs um, have now acquired pretty much the entire tool chain. What we do lack is um, general attractiveness. In other words, you know, external capital, capital coming from uh, other European countries or the US or uh, China and Asia at large, uh, should now look at France as a, as a market that is not as bad as it seems, that labor laws are not as bad as they seem, um, and that the M&A market becomes a little more fluid. Um, so we're missing a few pieces, but the French ecosystem is on a very good track and clearly, uh, Macron is pro-business, pro-new uh, economy, if you wish. And so, you know, the trend and the, the growth of our ecosystem should be sustained. Let's be careful because it's a very fragile ecosystem. And again, it took 50 years for Silicon Valley to produce a Google uh, or Facebook. Okay, thank you very much, Jan. It's 1.53 Paris time, and so it's time to... Uh, we're going to start to end this uh, first show. So thank you very much for everything, for being here and sharing what you've just done. Uh, it was really, really cool. Uh, thank you for all the audience who was there. Uh, before I let Sabrine uh, wrap up all the session and talk about the next session coming, I uh, just want to uh, share and say some words for uh, a guy named uh, Vijay Singh, who was uh, a good friend and was in my executive MBA class, and he actually passed away two weeks ago, and it's a huge shock for the, the whole class and the community, and just having to have some few words for, uh, for his wife, actually, and uh, he was a great guy, so uh, that's, uh, that's really a pity. Uh, life goes on, yeah, true, but good people leave. So, uh, so I think that's all I want to say. Say, you know, one important thing as well, because there is one nice gimmick of this show. Uh, it's that, sorry, I'm crying a bit, but it's, it was a good guy. And uh, we ask each entrepreneur coming, uh, what is their favorite track about music, track about entrepreneurship? So uh, this is going to change from you know, each person will have different taste. So uh, Jan, what is the track, very good track that you actually uh, selected in order to end this session? Okay, so that, you asked me the question yesterday and I was, uh, I was intrigued by the question, so I did a bit of soul searching. 
And uh, the one uh, common thread in my career has been software. And uh, as I said earlier, I was coding, you know, starting at age 10. And it became more intense uh, later on when I was 14, 15, when I got my first uh, Walkman. So I was, I was playing uh, cassettes at the time. And uh, my mother had brought me the um, Johann Sebastian Bach uh, Brandenburg concert, concertos. And I think number five was the one I was listening to the most, especially for the um, clavichord uh, cadenza at the end. It was very, you know, very, very virtuoso and uh, with a lot of structure. You know, back has a lot of structure built in. So my coding sessions were being uh, tempered and uh, paced by, uh, by that in a loop. And I was using that also to do uh, mathematical exercises and, and uh, studies. Okay, so we're going to listen to it at the real end of the session. Now, Sabrine, if you want to wrap all this up, and thank you for all the, the audience, and see you next week for me. Thank you. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we would like again to thanks a lot, uh, Jan Lachelle, to be the very brave uh, first uh, speaker for this uh, first radio show made by alumni for alumni. We'd like to thank again uh, Gilles Le Genex of his great initiative. Thank you also to the uh, INSEAD Center for Entrepreneurship for supporting this initiative too. Um, thank you to the audience who have been growing, you know, minute after minute during this uh, during this show. Thank you all so much. We are very looking forward to uh, welcoming you again for the second show that will take place next week on Wednesday with uh, Eliane Lavin uh, from Chanson Finance. And uh, the week after, uh, in June, we will welcome Kamel Hussein from Canada. Uh, we will send you very, very shortly uh, the topic uh, of, the, of the talks. And again, we would like to thank you all very much. And uh, you will be able to find a record of this session, of this show, uh, on our social media. Do not hesitate to spread the word. Do not hesitate to share with uh, your alumni mates. And uh, again, thank you all very much. Uh, looking forward to welcoming you again. Thank you. Bye. Thanks all.